Chapter 9, Section 1 Pell, 52852 Damon looked over the report on his desk. It was not the procedure he was used to, the martial law which existed in Q. It was rough and quick, and came across his desk with a trio of film cassettes and a stack of forms condemning five men to adjustment. He viewed the film, jaw clenched, the scenes of riot leaping across the large wall screen, flinched at recorded murder. There was no question of the crime or the identification. There was, in the stack of cases which had flooded the L.A. office, no time for reconsideration or niceties. They were dealing with a situation which could bring the whole station down, turn it all into the manner of thing that had come in with Hansford. Once life support was threatened... Once men were crazy enough to build bonfires on a station dock, or go for station police with kitchen knives. He pulled the files in question, keyed up printout on the authorization. There was no fairness in it, for they were the five the security police had been able to pull across the line. Five out of as many more as guilty. But they were five who would not kill again nor threaten the frail stability of a station containing many thousands of lives. Total adjustment, he wrote, which meant personality restruct. Processing would turn up injustice if he had done one. Questioning would determine innocence if any existed at this point. He felt foul in doing what he did, and frightened. Martial law was far too sudden. His father had agonized the night long in making one such decision after a board had passed on it. A copy went to the public defender's office. They would interview in person, lodge appeals if warranted. That procedure, too, was curtailed under present circumstance. It could be done only by producing evidence of error. And evidence was in cue. Unreachable. Injustices were possible. They were condemning on the word of police under attack, and the viewing of film which did not show what had gone before. There were five hundred reports of theft and major crimes on his desk, when before there had been a queue, they might have dealt with two or three such complaints a year. Comp was flooded with data requests. There had been days of work done on IDs and papers for queue, and all of that was scrapped. Papers had been stolen and destroyed to such an extent in Q that no paper could be trusted to be accurate. Most of the claims to paper were probably fraudulent and loudest from the dishonest. Affidavits were worthless where threat ruled. People would swear to anything for safety. Even the ones who had come in good order were carrying paper they had no confirmation on. Security confiscated cards and papers to save those from theft and they were passing some few out where they were able to establish absolute ID and find a station-side sponsor for them. But it was slow, compared to the rate of influx, and Main Station had no place to put them when they did. It was madness. They tried with all their resources to eliminate red tape and hurry, and it just got worse. Tom, he keyed. A private note to Tom Ushant, in the Defender's office. If you get a gut feeling that something's wrong in any of these cases, appeal it back to me regardless of procedures. We're putting through too many condemnations too fast. Mistakes are possible. I don't want to find one out after processing starts. He had not expected reply. It came through. Damon, look at the tally file if you want something to disturb your sleep. Russell's used adjustment. You mean he's been through it? No, not therapy. I mean they used it questioning him. I'll look at it. He keyed out, hunted the access number, pulled the file in comp display. Page after page of their own interrogation data flicked past on the screen, most of it uninformative. Ship name and number, duties... An arms comper might know the board in front of him and what he shot at, but little more. Memories of home, then. Family killed in a fleet raid on Cytene system mines. A brother killed in service. 
Reason enough to carry grudges if a man wanted to. Reared by his mother's sister on Cytine proper, a plantation of sorts. Then, a government school, deep teaching for tech skills. Claimed no knowledge of higher politics, no resentments of the situation. The pages passed into actual transcript, uncondensed, disjointed ramblings. Turned to excruciatingly personal things, the kind of intimate detail which surfaced in adjustment, while a good deal of self was being laid bare, examined, sorted. Fear of abandonment, that deepest. Fear of being a burden on his relatives, of deserving to be abandoned. He had a tangled kind of guilt about the loss of his family, had a pervading fear of it happening again, in any involvement with anyone. Loved the aunt. Took care of me, the thread of it ran at one point. Held me sometimes. Held me. Loved me. He had not wanted to leave her home, but Union had its demands. He was supported by the state, and they took him when he came of age. After that, it was state-run deep teach, taped education, military training, and no passes home. He had had letters from the aunt for a while. The uncle had never written. He believed the aunt was dead now, because the letters had stopped some years ago. She would write, he believed. She loved me. But there were deeper fears that she had not. That she had really wanted the state money. And there was guilt. That he had not come home. That he had deserved this parting, too. He had written to the uncle and gotten no answer. That had hurt him, though he and the uncle had never loved each other. Attitudes, beliefs. Another wound. A broken friendship. An immature love affair. Another case in which letters stopped coming. And that wound involved itself with the old ones. A later attachment to a companion in service, uncomfortably broken off. He tended to commit himself to a desperate extent. Help me, he repeated, pathetic in secret loneliness. And more things. He began to find it, terror of the dark, a vague recurring nightmare, a white place, interrogation, drugs, Russells had used drugs against all company policy, against all human rights, had wanted badly something Tally simply did not have. They had gotten him from Mariner's own. From Mariner, transferred to Russells at the height of the panic. They had wanted information at that threatened station, had used adjustment techniques in interrogation. Damon rested his mouth against his hand, watching the fragmentary record roll past, sick, at his stomach. He felt ashamed at the discovery. Naive. He had not questioned Russell's reports, had not investigated them himself, had had other things on his hands and staff to take care of that matter, had not, he admitted it, wanted to deal with the case any more than he absolutely had to. Tally had never called him. Had conned him had held himself together, already unstrung from previous treatment, to con Pell into doing the only thing that might put an end to his mental hell. Tally had looked him straight in the eye and arranged his own suicide. The record rambled on, from investigation under drugs to chaotic evacuation, with stationer mobs on one side and the military threatening him on the other. And what it had been... What had happened during that long voyage, a prisoner on one of Mazian's ships? Norway. And Mallory. He killed the screen, sat staring at the stack of papers, the unfinished condemnations. After a time, he set himself to work again, his fingers numb as he signed the authorizations. Men and women had boarded at Russell's Star. Folk who, like Tally, might have been sane before it all started. What had gotten off those ships, what existed over in Q, had been made of folk no different than themselves. He simply pushed the destruct on lives like tallies, which were already gone. On men like himself, he thought, who had gone over civilized limits 
in a place where civilization had stopped meaning anything. Mazian's fleet. Even they, even the likes of Mallory, had surely started differently. I'm not going to challenge, Tom told him. Over lunch, they both drank more than eight. And after lunch, he went to the small adjustment facility over in Red and back into the treatment area. He saw Josh Talley. Talley did not see him, although perhaps it would not have mattered. Talley was resting at that hour, having eaten. The tray was still on the table, and he had eaten well. He sat on the bed with a curiously washed expression on his face. All the lines of strain erased.